Grace and peace to you all, and welcome to the Calvary Road with Pastor Sam Allen. God, by the way, if he decides to force the issue with you or with me, he can get his way. He can. Now, he usually doesn't force me to do his will. Why? Because he wants a loving response. He wants me to do the right thing for the right reasons. But if I decide to do the wrong thing, well, he steps in. And I appreciate that, actually. I have to tell you, I didn't understand it in the beginning. Oh. today's broadcast, we begin a new two-part study from Pastor Sam entitled, The Road to Transformation. We're now in Acts chapter 9, and we will be looking at the first 31 verses. We've met this Saul character before, but now we get to meet a different version of him as he is converted to be a bondservant of Christ. So let's listen in. As you find your place, I'd like to share that over the years, I've heard a lot of people share their testimonies and testimonies usually fall into two well, types of testimonies. There are those of us that came out of the world. We were a mess. And so it's like, well, I was in drugs and I was drinking and I was my wife left me and 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 then I lost my truck and then, you know, I lost my dog. And, you know, it's like that 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 song, you know, what do you do when you pray, play a country song backwards? Have you heard that? It's like you get your dog back, you get your truck back, you get your wife back. But anyway. There are those of us who just were a mess before we came to Christ. And, and so when those of you, and there are many who grew up in the church, who lived a godly life, who always tried to do the right thing or mostly tried to do the right thing. When you hear those testimonies, you're like, oh, I wish I had a testimony like that. Let me assure you. No, you don't. You don't want that testimony, a testimony of how stupid you were and all the horrible things you did and all the relationships you shattered all of the suffering you endured and caused? No, that's not a great testimony. The great testimony is that God brings such people out of darkness into his glorious light, showed us that the deception we were in could be replaced by truth, that we who were dead in trespasses and sin could be alive together with him. Now, here's the other group. Those of you, and there are many, I again, I share it, I know this to be true, that have been good Christian people for most of your life. And if you think, well, I really don't have much of a testimony, that's not true at all. Unless you've never really encountered Jesus and been born again of his spirit. Because the real testimony is, isn't what we did before we came to Christ. It's how we came to Christ and what Jesus has been doing since. And I'd like to encourage every one of you to... to well, write it out. Have a five-minute testimony if someone asks, well, why do you go to church or Wednesday night? Why would you go serve on a Wednesday night? That seems crazy. That you could not, instead of, well, sharing, oh, well, Calvary's doing this or we were asked to do this, that you could just share your testimony. This is who I was. This is what I believed. This is where it led. And then I met Jesus and he's changed my life. So all I'm doing is in response to him. I'm serving because he is the servant of all. I'm loving and ministering because he loved and ministered to me first. Well, Saul is such a man and he has this kind of testimony. He's not the guy who was in the gutter or almost in the gutter. No, he's a highly regarded and respected religious character, religious figure. And well, he is on a road that ends up being the road to transformation. But you know, the Bible says there is a way that seems right unto man, but the end thereof is the way of death. And well, Saul's plan, his purpose, the, the passion of his life at this point is to try to stamp out what he considers to be the sect or cult of Christianity. He is as zealous and as religious and as spiritual as a man could be. But he's still dead in trespasses and sin. He still needs a testimony of Jesus' life-transforming power. Well, we read in chapter 9, verse 1, Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked letters from him to the synagogues of Damascus, so that if he found any who were of the way, take note of that phrase and kind of log it, we'll come back to it. Whether men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. As he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly a light shone around him from heaven. Then he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. It is hard for you to kick against the goads. 
So he trembling and astonished said, Lord, what do you want me to do? And the Lord said to him, arise and go into the city and you will be told what you must do. And the men who journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no one. Then Saul arose from the ground and when his eyes were opened, he saw no one. But they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And he was three days without sight and neither ate nor drank. Saul is mentioned 26 times, all of them in the book of Acts. He is named after the first king of Israel, and he is named hundreds of times in the Old Testament. Our Saul here will later be called Paul. So as you read through Romans and Galatians and Ephesians and Philippians and, well, book after book after book, he'll say, I, Paul. But he's the same guy, you see. Jesus is going to change him, then he's going to change his name. And we were first introduced to him at the stoning of Stephen. And we were told that Saul was a young man and they laid their clothing at his feet as Stephen, another young man, was being stoned simply for preaching that Jesus was and is the Christ. Saul hears all this and he hears Stephen say two things. Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. That had to be troubling because, you see, Saul doesn't believe Jesus is the Messiah. He doesn't believe he rose from the dead. He doesn't believe he's the savior of the world. But he can be sure that Stephen believes it. And so Stephen is bearing witness. And and we've talked about it. The word witness comes from the word from which we get our word martyr. And he was a witness in both sense. He testified faithfully and truly. And then he laid down his life in reality. And so he hears Stephen praying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And then he hears him praying, Lord, do not uh, charge them with this sin. Don't put this sin on their account. Now, I'm certain Saul had never heard anything like that unless he had been at the foot of the cross, which is possible. He was on the council. He was a part of that group that would have sent Jesus to the cross. And it's possible he heard Jesus say, Father, forgive them. They know Not what they do. Now he hears Stephen. Don't lay this sin to their charge. Now one of two things happen when people are confronted with a living and real witness for Jesus. They either are softened and they come toward the Lord or they're hardened and they get more aggressive and intense in their hatred of and and persecution of the Lord's people. And really, that's the way Saul goes initially. He was consenting to his death. We read it back in chapter 8 in the very beginning. And a great persecution had arisen at that time there in Jerusalem that scattered the disciples. We talked about it into Judea and into Samaria, except the apostles. And as they went and buried Stephen, Saul, we read in verse 3 of chapter 8, made havoc of the church, entering every house, dragging off men and women and committing them to prison. That brings us to chapter 9, verse 1, which we just read a moment ago. Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and he asked letters from him to the synagogue of Damascus so that if he found any who were of the way, whether men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Saul has been going house to house, finding Christians, having them arrested, seeing they stand trial. And I don't know if the Christians were hiding out or if they'd gotten away, but he's saying, man, the slim pickings. I think I'll head up to Damascus. And I've heard there are a lot of Christians that have escaped up to that area. And so he gets letters authorizing the arrest of those people if he found them so he could drag them back and bring them to trial. Now, as all of this is starting to go down, we we read and I said, take note of it, that he was to arrest any who were of the way. This is what the Christians were first called, the people of the way. And I really like that, knowing that Jesus is the way, the truth and the life. Long before they were called Christians, they were called people of the way. Well, in any case, this is where Saul's transformation begins. On the road to Damascus, there is a confrontation. And I like to suggest that every born-again believer has been confronted personally by the Lord Jesus. Now, Saul's confrontation is radical and dramatic. Perhaps yours was as well. Most of us would say, well, there was no blinding light. I didn't hear the angels singing. I didn't see Jesus personally. Most of us just heard the word, 
The truth took root and, and we realized if he's the way, the truth and the life and no one comes to the father but by him. And if the father's in heaven and there's only one other destination, at the very least, I don't want to end up there. I want to be with Jesus in heaven. Now, there are those people that are like, no, I want to be with my friends in hell. <laughs> I don't want to miss the party. It's not going to be a party. I think you haven't really read Revelation or really looked into what the Bible says about hell. But the, the deal is, Saul, this highly respected, highly regarded, highly motivated religious leader on his way to, well, savage and ravage more Christians. And as he is, a bright light from heaven and a voice from heaven and, and, and this confrontation. Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Now get this. Saul knows it's the Lord. He just doesn't know it's Jesus because he says, who are you, Lord? And it's the first and fundamental question that, well, we want everyone to ask. As we go out to share, we're not preaching how good we are, how great our church is, or how wonderful this is or that is. We're preaching Jesus. We love him. We're serving him. We're representing him. It's all about him. And when it becomes about anything else, as important as those other things might be, when something besides Jesus is the primary thing, well, the whole work just dries up and becomes difficult and a work of the flesh. Now, we're all engaged and involved in different types of ministries. We support all sorts of parachurch organizations in this community and around the world. But we're doing that in response to Jesus. It's not our primary thing. Our primary thing is him, to worship him, to know him, to be transformed by him, to fellowship with him, to be used by him, to bring glory to him. Well, the confrontation, if you haven't had it, it could happen today, but you'll have to get past me for that to happen. You'll have to realize the Lord is here and he's speaking to you. I know that can be hard when you keep hearing me talk. It's like, yeah, well, if you weren't here, maybe I'd hear the Lord. Well, maybe you would, but I'm here, so deal with it. And if Jesus is talking to you, respond to him. That's what it's about. It's not about you and me connecting or you agreeing with me or you becoming like me. It's you agreeing with Jesus. He says you're dead in trespasses and sin. And I affirm that. That the wages of sin is death and the gift of God is everlasting life through Jesus Christ our Lord. That's what I'm preaching. That you can find life and forgiveness and, and, and the reason you exist in the first place in coming to Jesus. And that's true if you've never come to know him, certainly. But for those of you who do know him and you have been serving him and you are growing in him, the second question becomes essential. And it's a question we don't ask once and it's a done deal. No, it's a question we should be asking daily. And especially in the midst of any trial or any confusion at any crossroads, what do you want me to do? By the way, when he's confronted by Jesus and he says, who are you? The Lord responds, I'm Jesus, whom you are persecuting. It's hard for you to kick against the goads. I don't want to fail to mention it. When the church is persecuted, Jesus takes it personally. He says, when you've done it to the least of these, my brethren, you've done it unto me. That means when we do good or someone else does good to God's people, God's church, he takes that personally. When somebody mistreats and abuses God's church, he takes that personally personally. And by the way, if you've looked at this image of the church and you're like, okay, the church, it's not the building, it's the people. Very important that we all know that. But we're not just called the church, are we? We're called the body of Christ. Good reasons for that. It's a lesson all and of its own. But we're also called the bride of Christ. And here's something I've learned over the years. Well, Jesus doesn't accuse his bride. So husbands, tune in for a second. If you're having problems with your wife, the first thing you need to do is make sure you're loving her unconditionally and sacrificially. Am I saying wives are never wrong? No, wives are sometimes wrong, but men are mostly wrong. And, and the, the truth is when there's tension and problems, more times than not, it's really us. And there are three words I've learned, and, and they're still hard to utter. I was wrong. You know, you were right. That's even harder. It's one thing to admit you were wrong. Another to admit she's right. But, but man, you got to hear it and know it and apply it. Here's the other thing. Know that as much as you love your wife and you could maybe have some issues with her or get into some discussions, since Christians don't argue, we just discuss, you know. But, but if you could get into that with your wife, you were never going to let another man talk rudely to her. And I want to tell you something. She is 
part of the bride of Christ. So that's probably not a good idea for you to be talking rudely to Jesus' bride. See, she's not just yours. She is his. And so in every way, we want to take what we're learning and we want to apply it so that well, when we go home, we're not just smarter than we were when we came in, more knowledgeable, but, but we're being transformed by our time together. The other issue, why are you persecuting me, is we are promised persecution. Now, I've read a lot of, well, I don't buy them. I just scan them at the bookstores. And those promise books, you've seen them, you know, 100 promises from Jesus, 200 promises from Jesus. He, they never include ones like all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. They'll just say, well, that was Paul. That's why. But it is a promise. It's not just a maybe or a might be or it could be. No, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. And you need to know that when you're persecuted, Jesus is right there. He's with you. He's for you. He's on your side, you see. And he'll deal with those who are persecuting you. Well, the confrontation leads to a revelation. I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. And then the second question, Lord, what do you want me to do? I believe this is the beginning of Saul's transformation. When you go from asking who the Lord is to realizing Jesus is Lord, and then you say, what do you want me to do? Now, his response is specific to Saul. He's not going to tell us to do the exact same thing he tells Saul to do here. But a lot of what he has in mind for Saul will be true for us as well. And as soon as we realize that, it changes the dynamic of our relationship with God and with one another and with the world around us. Well, blinded by the encounter... He's led to Damascus, this proud and arrogant and self-righteous and zealous Pharisee. Now he's like, could you just lead me in? I can't see anything. How embarrassing is that? And it gets worse. Well, he gets to Damascus. He fasts for three days. And in verse 10, we read, there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias. And to him, the Lord said in a vision, Ananias. And he said, here I am, Lord. And the Lord said to him, Arise and go to the street called Straight and inquire at the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus. For behold, he is praying. And in a vision, he's seen a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand on him so that he might receive his sight. God is working on Saul. He's working on and with Ananias. So he appears to Ananias and Ananias says, here I am, Lord. It's like, what do you want? And, and the Lord's like, I want you to go and I want you to share, to lay hands on and share with this guy, Saul. Now, I know it's not a big deal and it might not even be God's intention, but he's on a street called Straight. And I like that because he was on the road to destruction. Now he's on Straight Street. And when I was young, well, you know, they talked about Al Capone and all these gangsters back in the, you know, the day. It was long before my day. But, but when a gangster or a criminal stopped being a gangster or a criminal, they used to say he was, he'd gone straight. You know, he was crooked, but now he's gone straight. In my day in the 60s and 70s, stoners who figured it out, well, they said that well, we'd gone straight. We'd gotten straight. You know, we'd stopped being stoners and now we were, we were called straight. We are straight. Now, not everybody figured it out. Most of them moved to Oregon and Washington, but apparently we still have a lot in California because we're ready once again to vote on, should we make, hey, we already made medical marijuana legal. And, and, hey, I have no problem with that. I am a little concerned that you can get mer medical marijuana for a stubbed toe. But, but uh, I, I think we're just, we're just pushing the envelope, our state, to a place that is going to cause a lot of chaos and confusion. But it's not in the text and it's not the main thing I'm dealing with. We do know that Ananias is confronted by the Lord. His name, by the way, and you got to love this, means God is gracious. And I don't know for sure what, Saul was praying. We're told he was praying. He might have been praying, Lord, could I just have my sight back? Most likely praying, Lord, please forgive me. Please have mercy on me. I, I did it ignorantly in unbelief. That will be his testimony later. You know, he'll say, I, I, I'm an apostle, but not worthy to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of Christ. Well, Ananias has a problem. He knows about Saul. And he says in verse 13, Lord, I've heard from many about this man, how much harm he's done to your saints in Jerusalem. And he has authority from the chief priest to bind all who call on your name. 
Ananias responds the same way that Jonah did. And I think for the same reasons. You know, when Jonah was called to Nineveh, he realized these people are dangerous. They were known not just for murdering those they, they conquered, but they tortured and tormented them before they murdered them or in the process of murdering them. And, and so he had to have some fear. And he also had a knowledge that it's possible, just possible, that God could forgive those guys. We know this to be true because, well, when God says, I have something for you, he's like, where do you want me to go? What do you want me to do? He's like, I want you to go preach to the Ninevites to repent. And Jonah pretty much said, that's not going to happen. And he got on a ship and he headed the opposite direction. And God's like, we'll see. And, uh, you know, God, by the way, if he decides to force the issue with you or with me, he can get his way. He can. Now, he usually doesn't force me to do his will. Why? Because he wants a loving response. He wants me to do the right thing for the right reasons. But if I decide to do the wrong thing, well, he steps in. And I appreciate that, actually. I have to tell you, I didn't understand it in the beginning. I thought, oh, man, all this suffering, what's this about? And I'm doing the right thing. And no, the, the, the reality, well, and we're going to see it here. Sin always leads to suffering and God just trying to keep us from sin and from the suffering and the sorrows that accompany it. Well, Jonah didn't want to go, but he went anyway. And when he got there and he preached the message, and it wasn't exactly God loves you guys and has a glorious plan for your life. It was repent. Well, actually, 40 days in your history, you know, and that's the part I'm sure he thought, well, at least I get to tell them they're about to die. But here's what happens. They did repent. And from the eldest to the youngest, from the, the king all the way to the poorest of the paupers, they repented in sackcloth and ashes. And God forgave these Ninevites who had just been the worst that you can imagine. I mean, they were the terrorist of their day. And God forgave them because they truly repented and turned to him, at least in that generation. And now Jonah, he's sitting on a hill and he's miserable. He's in the middle of the greatest revival that you've ever read about in scripture. And he's like, I can't believe it. I hate this. I, I knew this was going to happen. I knew that you were merciful. I knew that you were gracious. And I just, I hate that about you, Lord. And of course, he doesn't hate it that when he cried for mercy from the fish's belly, the Lord showed him mercy, but he hates that he's showing his enemies mercy. So see, Jonah was a man used by the Lord, but not transformed, not completely. So be sure of this. God can use even someone who isn't sold out to the purposes of God. But why not sell out and say, Lord, whatever you want, I'll do it. Well, Ananias doesn't want to go. And I think he's afraid. And I think he might have some hatred. Who knows? Maybe he has friends. Maybe he has family. Maybe he has acquaintances who've been persecuted by Saul. But God just, he's not going to let Ananias off the hook on this. As Ananias says, do you know who we're talking about? I mean, have you missed it? This guy's dangerous. He's deadly. He's on a crusade. The Lord said to him, go. I like that because he said earlier, go. And he always does that. Once, once you state your you know, concerns or, or your you know, reasons why you don't, he just goes back to what he told you to do. I said, go, go, go. For he is a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name before Gentiles, kings, and the children of Israel. For I will show him how many things he must suffer for my name's sake. In Philippians chapter 3, verses 4 through 6, we read this about Paul's backstory. He tells us that if anyone should have confidence in the flesh, it should be him. After all, he was circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews. And concerning the law, he was a Pharisee. Concerning zeal, he persecuted the church. And concerning the righteousness which is in the law, he was blameless. That last word, blameless, says it all. Before Christ, Paul used to think of himself as righteous. Quite a difference from his words in 1 Timothy where he declares himself the chief of sinners. Now the world tells us from an early age to have self-esteem. And this sounds like a nice, supportive thing to develop stable, well-adjusted individuals. But look at that contrast of Paul. When we consider ourselves righteous outside of Christ, look how dangerous we can become and how the enemy can use us. And when we recognize that our true worth is in Christ and the only righteousness we have is his, 
look at how mighty we can be used for God's purposes. The Calvary Road is a ministry of Calvary Chapel Chico, and you can visit our website, ccchico.com, or download the CC Chico app to contact us and listen to other studies from Pastor Sam. You can also listen to The Calvary Road as a daily podcast by visiting thecalvaryroad.com. We'd love to hear from you. And until next time, may you find grace and peace as your journey takes you down the Calvary Road. And your grace.